We are going to lead this day by highlighting different people from our community. Uh, the first is not a lightning talk. We have two of those for right after, but it is going to be Todd Park, the Chief Technology Officer of the United States. Please join me in welcoming Todd. Hello, good morning. How is everybody doing? Woohoo! All right. Well, thanks so much for gathering here this weekend for the spectacular, spectacular uh, topic and spectacular cause. Uh, I'm, I'm Todd Park. I'm the CTO of the of the U.S. Um, I just started about uh, six weeks ago. Uh, before that, I spent about two and a half years being a CTO of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Before that, I was a, a tech entrepreneur. Um, and uh, uh, just actually a brief bit of background about what the heck uh, a CTO of the U.S. actually does. Um, the uh, job description is actually to be tech entrepreneur in residence at the White House. Uh, it's actually a clone, government-wide, of the job I did at uh, Health and Human Services, which was to be tech entrepreneur at HHS. And, and the idea is, is that at HHS, uh, and now at the White House, uh, my job is actually not to run all technology for the whole U.S. federal government or for all of HHS prior, but rather uh, to aim at jujitsu points, uh, to actually uh, dream up working with the best innovators inside and outside government uh, projects initiatives that I then recruit amazing people for, uh, that we then actually point at these key jujitsu points with the aim of unleashing the power of data, tech, and innovation to improve the well-being of the American people. Uh, we had a spectacular time doing this at HHS, uh, are really eager to replicate uh, this experience more broadly across the federal government. Uh, and actually what I want to do uh, in my brief talk this morning is key in on one particular axis of attack, one particular jujitsu point one particular set of initiatives about which I'm particularly passionate, which is data liberacion and the power of data to generate enormous amounts of good for society. So there's actually, I think, no particular cause about which I care more than this one, data liberation and its ability to do good. Uh, and let me actually start by, by talking about a project we spun up uh, at HHS when I was CTO of HHS called the Health data initiative. I want to talk about kind of the origins of it, uh, progress, its future, and then implications for the federal government more broadly. Um, so just to make sure I don't cover ground that you all already know, how many folks here have heard of the, the health data initiative? Okay. So um, forgive me for the rest of you, but I'm just going to skip over the basics and kind of jump straight to kind of uh, the, the, the key points I want to talk about that I think are uh, uh, particularly relevant for, for what you all are doing today. So, so as, as all of you, it turns out, know, <laughs> Health Data Initiative is an effort uh, to liberate data from the vaults of HHS uh, and make it available in machine-readable form to innovators and entrepreneurs and changemakers everywhere to turn into insights, products, services, programs, capabilities, features that can help improve the health of the country. Uh, we started about uh, two years ago, and the really critical insight that we got from the very beginning and it was incredibly helpful uh, to get this from folks like Tim O'Reilly, Clay Johnson, and Sunlight, right, was that the, the mission objective of Health Data Initiative wasn't just to liberate data, right? Data by itself is useless, right? You can't eat data and be healed. You can't pour data on a wound and heal it, right? The whole point was to actually use data as a way to catalyze the emergence of an ecosystem of innovation, right, that actually can use that data as fuel to power products, services, programs, capabilities that actually move the ball forward on health and well-being. Uh, so Tim O'Reilly said, look, the first thing that you need to do if you want to build an ecosystem of use of this open data is you should really talk to the users. <laughs> that would be really helpful. So opposed to just blindly releasing a bunch of data and hoping it kind of randomly has an impact, right? Why don't you bring in a bunch of users and ask them what they think? So uh, with the help of a bunch of folks, we convened in March 2010 a gathering of 40 kick-ass innovators from the world of tech, open data, health, et cetera. And the best thing about this group was that you had folks like Tim O'Reilly, right, who's like Thomas Jefferson of, of the tech world, right? And you had folks like Don Berwick, who's Thomas Jefferson of Healthcare Quality Improvement. Interesting thing, not only had Tim and Don never uh, actually even met before, they didn't know who each other were. And they're both like legendary figures in their fields. And so it speaks to the kind of increasing fragmentation of expertise in today's society that Don Berwick and Tim O'Reilly didn't know who each other were. But what was fantastic about this group was that that dynamic was actually present throughout the group. And basically, the flip side <laughs> of bringing them together uh, was that they, by linking together, mashed up their expertise, mashed up their brains to come up with things, right, that none of them by themselves would come up with. 
And so what we basically did was we grabbed a whole pile of data, which was mainly community health performance, healthcare system performance data, uh, and healthcare provider quality data that we were making more accessible. We put it in the middle of the room and said, look, if you had this data, right, genius folks like Tim O'Reilly and Don Burke, what would you do with it? And we locked them in a room for eight hours <laughs> and didn't let them out until they told us the answer. And they came up with 20 entire classes of new product services programs that can leverage this data to do enormous amounts of good. And then spontaneously, we called an audible and said, well, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Because we just didn't we didn't we didn't want it to be yet another meeting where people came together and came up with ideas and then nothing happened afterwards, right? We wanted there to be action. So we called an audible and we said, okay, in 90 days, the Institute of Medicine and Secretary Sibelius of HHS will host, we hadn't checked it with her yet, but we're pretty sure it'd be cool, will host a data palooza, a public data palooza where any of you or your friends or friends' friends who could build one of the things you just brainstormed will make you famous, right? Nine days later, folks came with over 20 newer upgraded new products or services that helped people improve health and healthcare and showed them to the world and it was just absolutely stunning, stunning. And not only did it inspire more innovators to do more stuff, but also incredibly importantly, we brought a whole bunch of HHS data owners to this data palooza, people who kind of crossed their arms and said, well, I don't know about this data liberation thing. I can only imagine terrible things that would hurt people and not things that could help people. And then they saw what other innovators had done in just 90 days that were amazing, that could help people in all kinds of ways, improve health and healthcare, and they got the joke. They said, oh, <laughs> if I just make my data available and make it machine readable and let people know it's there, lots of other smart people will do amazing things with it that can help people without me having to actually spend money or effort to do so. Things that I couldn't even have thought up myself. So it was a living embodiment of one of our favorite laws, which we're quoting all the time now, uh, which is Joy's Law, which I'm sure you've heard of, right? Bill Joy. Uh, co-founder of some microsystems once famously said, no matter who you are, no matter who you are, you have to remember that most of the smartest people in the world work for somebody else. Yeah? So the corollary you know, that we discovered was that if you really want to maximize taxpayer return, social return, on investment in health data at HHS, don't just have HHS's own smart people and a very narrow band of other people work on it. Make it available to anyone and everyone who can turn to magic. And that's what we saw at this first data pollutant. And so that then ignited a virtuous spiral of more data being liberated, more awesomeness being built with it, which then led to more data being liberated, which led to more awesomeness being built with it, and an up, upward spiral of, 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 of incredibleness. And one of the best ways to actually mark progress uh, are these now annual data pollutants that we're doing. It's, it's hard for us to track everything happening with the data because we, we publish the bulk of this data on healthdata.gov, as I'm sure a lot of you know, and we don't make you register to get it. We don't make you sign a contract. We just want to make the barrier super low. So you just grab it and do stuff with it. Uh, and don't, you don't have to tell us what you're doing with it, but that makes it a little bit hard for us to track. So actually one of the ways that we actually do know what's going on is we do these annual health data pollutants. How many of have you have actually been to one of our data pollutants? Okay, well then for the, the rest of you actually, uh, there's one coming in uh, uh, June, which I'll talk a bit more about, but basically what the data pollutants are, they're, they're, they're festivals of awesomeness on an epic scale. It's basically the only way to describe it. And what we do is we, we issue an open call, Institute of Medicine, HHS, uh, and now actually joined by partners like Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, California Health Foundation, uh, uh, Health 2.0, uh, Orion Media, and others. And what we do is we issue an open call to anyone in America, anyone in the world, who's taken our data and used it as fuel to build a product or service that can help people. You're invited to actually showcase your work via a TED style talk at this data palooza. Uh, last year, uh, 2011, we did our second data palooza. Uh, and we had this problem, which was that so many people, so many people actually qualified under our criteria because they'd built something awesome that we didn't have room for them. Didn't have room for them. So we ended up doing an American Idol style bake-off process, uh, to, uh, literally in front of you know, doctors and patients and community leaders to have them judge uh, the contestants. And actually, um, uh, this is actually something that, that has become infamous um, uh, in our circles. But um, I was actually not a judge. I was allowed to be an observer. And people started calling me Paula Abdul <laughs> because because I don't watch American Idol, but if Paul Abdul's like really enthusiastic and loves everyone, weeps and joy constantly and gets angry at the judges saying mean things, that was me. <laughs> I loved everybody. And uh, fortunately, the judges were much more discriminating than me. Um, and they narrowed it down to 50, 50 amazing innovators that got showcased on uh, uh, June of last year who had built all kinds of new services and products that help you uh, find the right healthcare provider for your family or get access to a clinical trial that could save your life or get the latest and greatest health information about your asthma at your fingertips or help doctors deliver better care, help journalists uncover massive disparities in health outcomes by gender and ethnicity in your community and mobilize action or help public health officials or mayors see where all the, the problems are, food deserts, air quality deserts, et cetera, and take action. Uh, all kinds of amazing products and services that were already live in the marketplace, already serving tens of millions of people. And 
growing quite rapidly. And the net expenditure of HHS dollars to build any of those things, zip, 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 bupkis, nada, zero, right? All we did was take data that you already paid for, right? Made it available, made it machine readable, actually marked the fact that it was there, and then American innovators did the rest. And the secretary said it best. She said, if you look at just these 50 innovations, which is just a small subset of what people are doing with their data, right? No one organization, no 10 organizations could have even dreamed this stuff up, let alone have actually built them and deployed them in a way that's helping so many people. So we continue to see, uh, even post that data palooza, well, actually, especially post that data palooza, an ever rising tide of more data being liberated, uh, more products and services and, and programs being started, and more grassroots action. And so just to talk briefly about, about each of those. So the data is <laughs> out of control. It's just amazing. One of the things that happened after the, the June 2011 data palooza was that Secretary Sibelius was so excited that she issued an executive order to every HHS agency saying that every six months, the secretary going forward, till the end of time, should actually get a data liberation plan from every agency uh, that explains what data they've made accessible, made public, and then what they're going to do to make data more accessible, more public going forward. Uh, and people have made ongoing strides uh, over the last couple of years, and it's accelerating to do this. And so everything from making Medicare claims data available in lots of different UAs, um, uh, data on a Head Start Center performance, uh, uh, new information recently released on hospital error rates, which is very eye-opening, uh, 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 basically which uh, electronic health record vendors have the highest success rate in terms of helping doctors achieve meaningful use of electronic health records, so on and so forth. Um, on top of actually brand new data being released, another really important axis of of improvement is it's, it's less sexy to talk about, but I think it's profoundly important. Turns out a lot of data that HHS released that was already public was unusable by third party developers, right? Or very hard to use. It was in the form of literally books <laughs> or PDFs or static websites, right? And we said, look, that's great, all right? But you know, it's like 2012 now, right? And you should make it available in downloadable files and APIs preferably RESTful APIs, so and so forth, right? But we said, look, whatever you can do, just even an Excel spreadsheet, even just a CSV file, just start with that. Just put it out <laughs> in a machine-readable form, right? Which isn't that hard to do, because it's in the machine now, right? <laughs> so just get it out there, and then, then progress over time. And so, so people have been doing this, and they've actually improving accessibility uh, of that data. And so uh, I think this crowd will probably appreciate this more than most crowds do, but you know, we have this hospital compare database that's been out for several years that has really great information along with a, a nursing home compare database and home health agency, home data, uh, quality database that's got really detailed quality and patient satisfaction metrics for like every hospital, every nursing home, every dialysis center, every home health agency in America. So we recently actually added an API to it, which makes it exponentially easier for third party folks to grab that stuff, right? We've got this amazing file called Daily Med. Have you heard about this, Daily Med? So this has been actually publicly available technically for a while. It's a, it's a huge database. Uh, of all the structured product label information filed with the FDA of, of every drug in the universe, right? It's an extremely difficult to work with file. Uh, but FDA just actually, um, in February, um, uh, uh, deployed a RESTful API to access it, which makes it exponentially easier to use, um, so on and so forth. Uh, healthcare.gov uh, is a site that we launched under the health firm law uh, in uh, July 2010, uh, June 2010, I'm sorry, uh, July 1st, 2010, and we've iterated since then. It includes incredible data about all the insurance products, all the public insurance plans across the country, public and private actually, um, by zip code, what their benefits are, what their pricing is. Uh, never before seen data like uh, the percentage of the time that a given insurance plan will reject people for that insurance or will actually charge them more than the sticker price based on health status. Uh, so we're actually gonna be soon deploying an API to that to enable people to extract all that data as well. And so again, this crowd probably finds that sexy. I find it incredibly sexy. <laughs> it takes me a little bit longer in most eyes to explain why an API or why machine readable data is really, really important, but this crowd totally gets it. And so that's a big, big, big axis of effort. Uh, not just release brand new data, but take existing data and actually make it machine readable. And then finally, uh, you know, what I'm just super excited about is that uh, we're, not, we're no longer the only people who are actually uh, proselytizing and advancing the cause of using our data uh, in open ways to do good. Um, so you know, we have done actually a fair number of meetups and codathons ourselves, but now I'm getting invited to more and more meetups and codathons that came out of nowhere. Um, so uh, over the last couple of weeks, for example, I got invited by Palo Alto Medical Foundation, a medical group, that it actually, I think, has did the first ever hackathon sponsored by a physician group, um, uh, which attracted like 300 people in Palo Alto, uh, dedicated to using open data uh, to help build tools that help uh, seniors age successfully. Uh, and then I was just actually 
two days ago, I'm just keeping track, <laughs> at the first ever Cajun Code Fest. Cajun Code Fest. So I've been to the state of Louisiana, talked to a bunch of folks in government there, talked about data liberation, they got very excited. Um, a guy named Ramesh Kolaru at the University of Louisiana Lafayette like stood up and said, I'm gonna do a hack fest around open health data for health improvement in Lafayette. I said, that's great, that's fantastic. I didn't know what was gonna happen. And then four and a half months later, I got invited to this huge hack fest, code fest in uh, Lafayette, uh, which mobilized, again, about 300 participants, about 115 developers, but with doctors, nurses, and uh, other experts uh, to work with open data supplied by both HHS and the state of Louisiana and others to develop solutions to help contribute to the fight against childhood obesity. Uh, there are more and more challenges being issued by folks who are actually not government agencies. Actually, most of the challenges being issued now <laughs> around our data and what to do with it are being issued by other foundations, uh, uh, companies, other organizations besides the government. Um, and uh, maybe one of the best indicators of all this is uh, and how out of control it is is that um, this year's Health Data Palooza is happening June 5th and 6th here in DC. Uh, if you're an enthusiast about open data and open innovation, I highly recommend that you go. Uh, it's gonna be in the Washington Convention Center. Uh, you can learn more about it at hdiforum.org, hdiforum.org. And again, we did the open call for anyone actually who's interested in showcasing something they built with our data that helps people. I uh, did the open call for them to actually throw their hat in the ring to compete. Uh, 230 plus companies their hat in the ring. They're going through an American Idol style process right now with doctors and patients, community leaders actually judging them, scoring them. And I went through all 230. I'm again not allowed to be a judge, <laughs> but I uh, went through all 230. I hadn't even heard of 90% of them. I said, Who are you? Which is just amazing. I looked at the founding dates of the companies or the nonprofits and so on and so forth. And I, I saw a lot of 2011, 2011, 2010, 2011, 2011, 2012, 2012, 2012, <laughs> which is just phenomenal, just phenomenal. I mean, it's just ridiculously out of control at this point, and that's exactly, of course, where you want it to be, right? Because as folks like Tim O'Reilly have taught us, right, the best ecosystems are not centrally controlled, right? The best ecosystems of innovation are absolutely beautifully chaotic, decentralized, and self-propelled, right? Where innovation comes from everywhere, and it's innovation actually from the damnedest places, from the most unexpected quarters that actually ends up being being the breakthrough. Uh, and so I just want to actually talk, if I have another second or so, um, another second, okay. Um, I just want to talk about one specific axis of how the ecosystem's coming alive, just to make it super concrete about what this means for the lives of actual people, right? So we actually just posted uh, recently a Medicare report that shows the impact of public reporting of open data on healthcare provider performance. So what it shows is that over the course of actually about five years or so, that for many, many metrics of healthcare provider quality performance, public reporting has driven huge improvement. So for example, if you have a heart attack and you go to an American hospital, right, there's a particular thing that you always need, get, need, need done with you, all right? There's a, there's a particular best practice of care that you should always actually get. Um, Medicare reported in 2006 uh, on this metric for the first time, indicated that actually, even though you're supposed to get this all the time, right, only 55% of Americans upon arrival at American hospitals, uh, within 90 minutes actually got this particular, uh, particular kind of care. Um, and if you get it after 90 minutes, your probability of actually ending up in a good place goes down pretty precipitously. So this actually triggered a whole kind of wave of consternation <laughs> among hospitals, um, understandably so. And uh, we actually just uh, did, the, did the analysis, and over the last five years, that number's gone 55% of heart attack patients getting the right care within 90 minutes of arrival at the hospital to 91%, to 91% which is amazing, right? And that absolutely means people's lives were saved. Absolutely means people's lives were saved through the power of open data. Now, there are a bunch of other metrics that actually didn't move, and it turns out that those metrics are actually harder to move, like for example, readmission rates um, after uh, discharge to the hospital, because you actually need to engage in a much more comprehensive system of attack than say, executing a particular intervention in this particular situation uh, you know, for a heart attack patient. And so, Kind of long story short there, under the health reform law, um, there is a big shift by Medicare from pay people by the piece, pay people per surgery per hospital say, to basically pay health care providers to keep people healthy. So they have a massive new incentive, okay, to use data to understand who their patients are, understand what gaps in care they have, do the stitch in time to get them on the medication, do the follow-up, et cetera, to make sure they don't get sick, don't end up in the ER, don't end up in the hospital. And to help those providers do that work, there's another open data access we've opened up. We actually, for the first time, are providing, if the beneficiary says it's cool, the patient says it's cool, we're sharing the patient's Medicare claims data with the patient's doctor so that they can pour it into tools that analyze the patient's data and say, okay, you've got this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem, which is absolutely fantastic, 
Um, we're also actually, because uh, we're so excited about what happened with, with hospital nursing home data, we're actually making data available uh, to private sector entities uh, that will actually enable the measurement of physician level quality performance data, which will start appearing later this year, uh, which will then, we hope, uh, elicit and engender the same kind of chain reaction of benchmarking and improvement, and also give consumers a sense of, of what doctor might be right for that. And then finally, um, if I have negative four seconds, sorry, negative four seconds. So, so a lot of what actually these new companies are doing, because uh, it turns out if you're, say, a, uh, one of these new kinds of healthcare providers, like accountable care organizations or medical homes, you go by a number of names, but basically, if you're now incented by Medicare, by private payers who are copying Medicare, uh, to proactively take care of people and do the stitch in time that saves, saves a hospitalization, right? 75% um, of the issue, 75% of the healthcare spend is actually on chronic disease. And it turns out it's really hard to impact chronic disease unless you engage the patient, right? So you're seeing a big shift in the healthcare provider world to actually become much more patient focused and engage the patient and help the patient better manage their, 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 their conditions. And so a bunch of the tools that are being built using all kinds of data sources H just made available are by new companies that actually aim to help doctors and patients do exactly that, um, which I could talk for like a long time about, which I don't have time for. Um, but, but this is very exciting. It's very exciting because there's concrete value being delivered by an ecosystem that's out of control. <laughs> and an out of control ecosystem delivering massive value, wow, that's freaking awesome, right? That is an awesome force for good, an awesome force for change. And so uh, the last thing I'd like to say is that actually uh, as, as USCTO, I plan to double down on health aid initiative and keep championing it, keep advocating for it, keep fanning the flames of it as much as I possibly can. And in the last you know, five, six weeks, I've been talking a lot with folks in education, energy, the nonprofit space, uh, public safety, personal finance, <laughs> and there is an opportunity to run this play again, and again, and again, and again. And so we are formulating the notion of uh, cloning Health Day Initiative in each of these spaces. And of course, the way we're gonna start is we're gonna take a page from the O'Reilly Playbook and not just blindly liberate data, okay? but actually gather innovators, gather developers, gather experts in each of these spaces in an ideation jam, show them the data we can actually make available now, and say, what would you do with it? Then they'll invent 20 new classes of services, and then nine days later, we'll do a energy data palooza, a education data palooza, and show the world what people can do, and that will actually catalyze a chain reaction. So we're gonna actually run that play again and again and again and again. And in each of these plays, we desperately need your help because <laughs> you guys are right smack dab in the bullseye of the kinds of people we want to recruit for these ecosystems, these emerging data innovation ecosystems. So when, when Jonathan Wunderlich asked me to come hang out, I jumped for joy and said, my God, I would love to be there. Would love to be there. Um, so, uh, so we're going to be actually making a whole series of um, announcements about the launch of these initiatives over the course of the next uh, few weeks. Um, so probably the the best way to keep track of that is maybe tune into my Twitter feed. Uh, we'll also try to kind of blog and have it go everywhere. Uh, but uh, my Twitter feed is at Todd underscore Park. And if you're interested in actually a particular area, like if you think you have something particular to bring to say energy uh, innovation or education data innovation, uh, data innovation or uh, public safety, uh, then please proactively ping me because we're actually trying to recruit people for these initial ideation jams. Uh, and you can email me. My new White House email address is tpark tpark at, a little bit complicated uh, sort of suffix here, ostp dot eop dot gov, gov. Uh, and for those of you who heard me speak before, you know I have a protocol, which is I answer all my own email, uh, but uh, if I don't get back to you in 72 hours, uh, then please reply back to me and say, you idiot, colon, uh, with your uh, subject matter. Uh, and then that, I, I, I really sort my outlook by you idiot, and then I know how to get back to people. Um, <laughs> And actually, uh, uh, um, uh, Tom Getz, the executive editor of Wired, recently publicized a hack uh, to this protocol, which is that you actually put you idiot in the first email, <laughs> and then you, <laughs> you make it to the top of the list. So, but seriously, you know, I'm here to recruit you to get involved <laughs> um, in a cause you've already been involved in, right, for a very long time, long before it was cool. It is now incredibly cool. It is now being sponsored uh, at a level that I find amazing uh, by more and more folks, uh, actually not just uh, in the US, but around the world. So, so please stay tuned for updates, uh, for opportunities to get involved, to, 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 to lend your talents uh, to these, these new initiatives. And if you actually have a particular interest in any one of them, just let me know, because uh, you're exactly the kind of people we want in the room ideating uh, to actually initially you know, put together classes of opportunity uh, for value that can be produced with data. So I'm so sorry for running over, uh, but I was so excited to be here. I did so much I wanted to say. Um, thanks so much for uh, spending some time with me. And God bless you. May the force be with you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.
man, I don't even know what to say. The one, the one comment I have to make, being half Italian, I always get yelled at for talking with my hands a lot, but Todd, you put me to shame. <laughs> um, that was incredible, and I hope that folks are tweeting out some of the information that Todd just said so that it can kind of spread through to everyone who wants to follow up with him. Um, speaking of following, we are going to start our lightning talks here. Let me pull this up. Our first lightning talk of the day is by a fellow who's joining us from Chicago, Illinois, Juan Pablo Velez, and he is right here as I understand, and you should be coming up to the front. He's, the, um, he's a member of Open Cities and is going to be talking to us about what's going on in the state of Illinois. So I get to follow Todd Park. That's awesome. Um, my story is going to be way less epic. It's going to be like pretty humble, and I get to show you my crappy little apps. Um, but... That being said, how are we doing this morning? Are we doing good? Yes? Are we working through our hangovers? Yes? Because I know the adrenaline is helping me punch through mine. Um, so, no, go back. That you just, uh, okay. <sighs> Should we start? Okay, let's start. All right, we're starting. Um, all right, so my name is Juan Velez. I'm a recovering journalist. That's the hack up top. And I'm a member of Open City, which is a volunteer group of designers, developers, data scientists, and researchers uh, who build civic apps in Chicago. We've been around for a year and, and built about six different things. And I'm going to show you about half of those this morning. Uh, so Chicago got a new mayor last year. You might have heard about it. And for whatever reason, this new guy is way more open to opening up the city's data than the old guy. Um, I spent a sickening amount of time as I, when I was a reporter just trying to get data out of the city, and I can tell you it's really a night and day difference. Um, so as a result, there's been this explosion of government data, and uh, a nascent community of civic hacker types is, is beginning to build stuff on top of uh, civic apps on top of it, and we're one of those, we're one of those groups. Um, so I want to tell you about some of the stuff we've built. This is Chicago Lobbyists. Um, uh, it lets you look at who's lobbying uh, the city uh, city hall in Chicago, who's paying them, who's paying those lobbyists, and what they're getting paid to lobby about. Um, when we first started working on this, we noticed that the data wasn't very good. It didn't let you see what people were actually getting paid to lobby about and who they were talking to. So we 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 reached out to the mayor's office and we're, and we're like, look, this is this is kind of shitty. You know, you should help us with this. And they were like, yeah, okay, we'll 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 turn it around and give you something much better. Open government. Imagine that. Um, and this is, this is something that we found is, is really key, uh, is this kind of responsiveness and attention to detail by government is, is really key to uh, dealing with some of the roadblocks that inevitably arise when you're trying to do some of these civic apps. So let me talk, this is another example of what we've built. It's a, it's a um, uh, budget visualization app for Cook County. Uh, Cook County is kind of the overlord county of Chicago. And uh, what it lets you drill down into every department, of which there are dozens, and see how much money they've spent over the last 15 years. Um, this is a jail. Uh, so, and, and so the Cook County uh, spends $3 billion a year on the jail, public hospitals, courts, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, but this is really the first time that taxpayers have been able to see where all that money is going. Um, and at a deeper level, um, on a deeper level, it's also the first time it's really been easy to get a handle on what the heck the county even does. Um, so our app actually says, like, here is the public defender. This is what the public defender does. And I think this basic education is really important because for all, um, for all the obsession in our political discourse about the size of government, very, very few people actually have a clue about what government does day to day. And that's kind of so that that's an important role that these transparency apps can play. Now, what's interesting in Chicago is that not only not only have uh, is the city releasing a ton of data, but they're also trying their hand at releasing their own civic apps. Um, so last winter, right before the first snowstorm, the city released Plow Tracker. As the name suggests, it lets you see where the plows are in real time during snowstorms. Now, we thought this was awesome, and we applaud the city. Um, for putting the, for scrapping this together, uh, but we wanted an app that would show you not where the plows are, but what streets have been plowed over the course of a storm. So we reverse engineered Plow Tracker during that first snowstorm, 
started pulling the plow location data out of it without telling the city, and then we sat on it for a week and just argued about when we would do it and how we would do it. But then the night before the second snowstorm, we were like, okay, you know what, let's just do it right now. And so we stayed up to all hours and slammed out clear streets, which lets you see where the streets haven't plowed. Um, uh, we got done right as the first snowflakes were falling the following day. We had no idea whether it was going to work. Not only did it work, but it promptly went viral, and then we ended up on this fluff page of the Chicago Tribune the next day. Uh, the story was basically, snowstorm, there's an app for that. Which I'm not beneath, you know, like I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, so I hope this is giving you a taste of, not a taste, I hope it's giving you a sense of uh, the state of OpenGov at the city level, or at least in Chicago. Uh, and also a taste of what's possible uh, with a little volunteering elbow grease. As for Open City, we've gotten a ton of uh, positive responses and useful feedback about the stuff we've built, um, including from the city of Chicago. So now we're thinking about how do we take the next step? Um, and how do we, how do we b turn some of these apps into scalable products that can have an impact? And, how do we al and then also, how do we help the, the mayor's office of Chicago uh, bring data-driven decision-making uh, into the way that the city does business. Um, shameless plug, my other gig is working for the civic startup called Purple Binder. We're trying to do Yelp for the social safety net. Uh, so that's food pantries, homeless shelters, uh, after-school programs, all those social programs that help low-income folks. And part of what we want to do is connect hospitals uh, to better connect the healthcare system and, and the safety net. So all, all of our stuff is open source, um, meaning you can repurpose it, uh, we've learned a ton about the logistics and the politics of building civic apps in the time we've been doing this. So if you're interested in this stuff, get in touch. Thanks. That was excellent. Thank you so much. Our last but not least Lightning Talk speaker is Daniela Silva, who's coming to us from Brazil. She is the co-founder and director of Espera and the coordinator of the Transparency Hacker community there. I'm Daniela. As Lorena said before, and I'm part of this community that's called Transparency Hacker. You can call us Transparency Hackers if that's easier, that's okay. And there we are in Brazil, and I could pretty much change the name of this presentation to how to make open data with no open data, because that's pretty much how we started there, and no money, because money wasn't exactly the trigger that got us into what we have today. So what happened is that back in 2009, uh, I was like researching public transparency and how could internet change it. And I was also part of, a, uh, I was working at a place really cool, that's the House of Digital Culture, where people make a lot of transformation using digital tools. And I happened to come to the Transparency Camp West. And after coming here and gathering with a lot of people, we thought, mm, maybe we should make a Transparency Hack Day, an event just like that, but that's more hands-on and where people go to build projects that they want to build over public information for political reasons. And after this first event in 2009, we gathered around 100 people, and these 100 people, we started a community. And this is the community that we have until today in Brazil, a community that's focused in projects that people want to do together. This is our main, uh, uh, now our main space for encounter and for conversation, that's our mailing list. We have now over 900 people that are part of that in Brazil. Many of them are very active. Many of, many of them are not only talking and discussing, but also building, uh, building new projects and creating new ideas about open data and transparency. I don't want to talk much about uh, the applications that we built, like this one. That's, do you know the 311 system that you call when there's a problem in your street and want it to get fixed? So we scrape the data out of it. Someone scraped the data out of it to make this application to show it, what's really important. Or even uh, the next one, please, yes. Like this one, do you think the, account, the accounting, like how much your deputies are spending is something important for people to know? Like this was not really open before, but someone scraped the data and made it. Uh, but I don't wanna really focus a lot in our applications because I think there's something more important to speak of that is like the process that we go through to build these things together. I saw on a slide just like this, on a on an elementary teacher presentation. She was like making movies with her children. And when I saw that, I said, hooray, someone said that. Thank you, because I think we're so much focused in products today. And I think the process of what we are doing is so much more important. There is like a huge opportunity for political change behind open data. So we're not only opening data because we think this is great and we are gonna make great applications over this, but especially we think this is an opportunity to change the way politics works. And I think we could do that in Brazil, like 
as an example, being a community like Transparency Hacker, the organization is very loose and we don't have like a letter of principles. I used to say to people that I think we look much more like the free software communities than the NGOs or the social movements the way they were built before because what connects people is the projects that they are working at. But that doesn't mean that we are crazy for tools and applications. That means that's highly political in the sense that we are working over things that have political value and that we believe that this can help power to be better split between people. If you can come back to the slide before, just I think one example of things that this can change, we could help on writing the access to information law in Brazil that passed through Congress last year. And because of all the noise that we were making on the internet, people came to us and asked, is this law prepared for open data? And we could actually mix up the text with the principles of open data. So we have a law now in Brazil that says that when government releases information, it has to be in open formats. It has to be in machine readable formats. They are supposed to let our applications to access their system to get information out of there. And I think, I think this is really important. But then again, this was all over the internet, right? And you say, ah, but this is on the internet. What kind of broader change can this bring? And we all are also thinking of that. We wanted to go to places and we wanted to find people and go to the cities and see what was going on there to see what this hacker culture and this transparency culture could actually change in people's lives, like in the place where they live at. So we wanted to buy a bus and that was the idea. Let's buy a bus. But we wanted the bus to be ours. We didn't want to go for a big company and ask them, can you give us money to have this bus that's going to take your name forever? So what is sad, we went to the internet and we used this tool that's called Catarse. You guys have Kickstarter here, so it's pretty much like it. You release your projects. You can have tons of sponsors instead of have, having only one. And we asked for 40,000 reais, that's pretty much $20,000 for people to help us to buy a node bus that would build as a hacker bus. And not only we made like 58,000 reais, much more than we expected, as almost 500 people believed on this idea and helped us to have the hacker bus. And this was the bus before we bought it. <laughs> and, it it's, and this is the bus after. And more than being painted and really colorful and beautiful, it has a lot of people on it. So the hacker bus is pretty much it. It's a bus that serves for the transportation of these hackers over there. Many of these people are developers, but many are not. Many are journalists and activists and people that work for organizations and lawyers, and they just came to this community because they thought there was a different way, different way of doing things there. Many people would ask us, why do you want a bus? And we would answer like, seriously, it's a bus. Like, can it be cooler than that? Like, we're gonna have our own bus. But as that sometimes is not enough, like we could make a lot of stuff. Can you go back to me? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we can, we can make with our bus. Like recently, we have been, I think we travel like a couple times already. This is, this is very new. So we started traveling with the bus in November last year but we did that around five or six times and we're like running open street maps workshops where people can build their free maps that don't rely on Google Maps anymore in their cities. We are running workshops for people to learn how to make bills, how to write their law projects, things that they wanted to become law and how to run this through this process together. We are showing people how to access technology in a, more, in a different way that's not only for your computer screen, but knowing how it works, like opening up, breaking it, it's, it's all part of the hacker culture. So I think the hacker was and things that we came through Transparency Hacker for the last three years are a good example of the capacity building that the internet and this new way of association and society can build things in the real world, like as real as a bus. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here and enjoy your day.